Hi, I'm Jacqueline Lukeman with The Real News Network. In 2014, when the city of New York finalized the $40 million settlement for the false arrest, malicious prosecution, and racially motivated conspiracy to deprive Raymond Santana, Kevin Richardson, Corey Wise, Youssef Salam, and Antron McRae, then between 14 and 16 years old, of their civil rights, Donald Trump wrote an op-ed in the New York Times condemning the settlement saying, settlement doesn't mean innocence. My opinion on the settlement of the Central Park jogger case is that it's a disgrace. A detective close to the case and who has followed it since 1989 calls it the heist of the century, Donald Trump went on to say in his op-ed. Trump's unsolicited commentary on the settlement received nationwide attention, and his original 1989 ads in five New York City newspapers called for the death penalty for the accused, and that's highlighted in a recent docudrama about the case called When They See Us, directed by Ava DuVernay. But what people don't have a clear understanding of are the connections between this case, the inner workings of white supremacy as a system, and how that system contributed to the rise of Donald Trump today. Here to talk about these connections and other issues are Glenn Ford. Glenn is the executive director of the highly regarded publication, Black Agenda Report. Thank you so much for joining me today, Glenn. Thanks for having me. A lot of people, especially black people, have said that this is a difficult miniseries to watch. And I completely understand that because it was difficult for me to watch. But why was it important for this docudrama miniseries to be produced and to be released today? And why should people watch it? Well, this, I have to say that this was a superb production, both as a film, uh, but particularly as a political uh, event. And it's, we're very fortunate that the director was a young black woman, Ava DuVernay, because I believe that it really took a young black women, woman uh, to tackle this subject of young black men accused of rape and two of their principal antagonists were young white women. Uh, I don't believe that anybody but a woke young black woman could have handled this subject, this politically very sensitive, today very sensitive subject, uh, better than Ava uh, DuVernay has. You know, she said that she didn't want to be uh, typecast uh, or type director cast uh, as a maker of controversial black issues films. Uh, but she's done a superb job handling this black issue. And I think of her in terms of a 21st century Ida B. Wells type figure. Ida B. Wells was the crusading journalist and activist uh, whose lifelong mission was to expose lynching of black people as in fact a political crime. Uh, lynching was packaged as retribution or a necessary evil in order to control the uh, young uh, and control black men uh, who had an insatiable lust for raping white women. Uh, but Ida B. Wells exposed the fact that of the thousands of black lynching uh, victims around the turn of the 20th century, only very few were even charged with rape. Uh, they were actually lynched, politically murdered, in order to terrorize the rest of the black community. But the political underpinnings that are, or overtones of this very case, um, can you expound on that a little more, especially in the context of uh, DuVernay's ability to uh, depict who the villains were in her uh, production, as opposed to how people may have remembered who the villains were uh, in the case or who the villains were portrayed in the original case. Well, we come away from this film uh, with a profound sense of who the victims were. The victims, besides the jogger herself, who was not victimized by the Central Park Five, but the victims here are the 
five young black men and the entire black community, and that this is not an isolated uh, crime, uh, that, and that the victimization, the framing, in fact, of these five young black men for rape uh, was also part of the larger picture in which the entire black community, but especially young black men, uh, are pre-convicted for a kind of perpetual uh, and ineradicable uh, uh, wilding. Uh, that is, and this term wilding, uh, which became uh, uh, part of the fodder of the corporate media during this period, really is a code word for uncontrolled black youth, uh, predators who need to be brought to heel. Well, this vocabulary, this racist vo political vocabulary that was later picked up by the likes of Bill and Hillary uh, Clinton and a host of other politicians on both sides of the political aisle, uh, this comes into great prominence with the Central Park Five. And the players uh, here, and I'm going back to the two uh, top prosecutors, uh, uh, Linda Feinstein uh, and uh, Letterer, uh, Elizabeth Letterer. Uh, these were young, youngish, uh, white women, firmly part of the Democratic political establishment in New York City. You see, Trump, the Republican, and I think he was not really a Republican at that time, uh, but Trump is not the only political villain. Uh, the crime that was perpetrated was one of the mostly democratic administration in this city. And we have these white females who are taking the lead. And uh, Fairstein in particular uh, made her bones. Uh, she became prominent as a defender of victims. But her ideology of victimology uh, portrays, portrays white people as the victims and the perpetual perpetrators as black people, uh, yet she traveled, uh, she had great uh, upward mobility uh, after her uh, star performance in the Central Park Five trial uh, as a paragon of liberal white woman virtue. Uh, she's said to have been the inspiration for Law and Order Spectrum Special Victims Unit, the uh, hit television uh, program. Uh, she went on to write 21 mystery novels, and she was a member of the boards of prestigious civic organizations and her, her uh, alma mater, Vassar, Vassar College. Uh, so she climbed her uh, political ladder on the backs of the prosecution of the Central uh, Park Five. So it's not just Donald Trump coming from what's seen as the far right that's part of this uh, societal victimization of the black community. Uh, all kinds of players are involved here, and that's why this is uh, such an important film. It's not the usual suspects. We all know that the cops beat confessions out of people. Uh, but the role that's played by respectable political folks like Letterer and Fairstein, uh, that was exposed in this film. And what was also uh, a reality that was not exposed in this film, but uh, I think speaks to maybe, I hope you can talk to the role of the media. You did mention Donald Trump and his role in stoking uh, 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 anti-black sentiment with his uh, $85,000 ads in five New York papers calling for the death penalty of the uh, accused who were just children at the time. There was no uh, physical or any evidence connecting them to the crime. The case was ongoing. There was a questionable a press conference uh, that the NYPD had that precipitated this, uh, uh, these ads by Donald Trump. But everyone remembers the ads by Donald Trump because he took these ads out in newspapers. But what people do not remember so much of, and this is the other political player, and I think this speaks to your comment about uh, the democratic institutions that are involved in this kind of injustice, was that Mayor, uh, uh, at the time, Michael Bloomberg, uh, actually 
was responsible for denying the settlement of the case in 2003 when it was first filed uh, and agreed upon. So this is why the settlement didn't actually happen until later. And Bloomberg was quoted as saying that no one's civil rights were violated. The city of New York did nothing wrong, violated no one's civil rights. And that he further went on to say that the NYPD and the detectives in the case acted in good faith. What is your response to that kind of comment uh, when the evidence by 2003 was very clear that these young men were framed, not only by NYPD, but as you said, by the prosecutor's office, by players in the prosecutor's office. None of the white institutions of New York City acted in good faith uh, during this episode. They had no good faith regarding the Central Park Five, but they didn't show good faith even in terms of their own institutions. Uh, good faith in terms of due process of law for those on the legal side, and good faith in terms of just exercising journalistic integrity on the corporate media side. Uh, what marked this case uh, was that very few uh, stories on the Central Park Five, and there was a torrent. It was the biggest uh, story of uh, its era. Very few stories even used the word alleged <laughs> crime. Uh, they were convicted uh, before uh, they ever faced trial by the media, by the newspapers and by the electronic media. These were not uh, alleged perpetrators. They were made uh, to be guilty uh, in the eyes uh, of the public through the corporate media. And that's one of the reasons that Donald Trump had to spend tens of thousands of dollars uh, to get his uh, give them death uh, demand uh, out there. Uh, he had to spend that kind of money to rise above uh, the lynch mob, uh, the din of the lynch mob that was coming uh, from the corporate media itself. And he had to up the stakes by calling for the death penalty while the corporate media was just condemning them as guilty uh, before trial. And, and, th and this, 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 this case really set the stage for the 90s. The uh, incident occurred in 1989, but it paved the way uh, for the rise of another prosecutor, uh, Ju uh, Rudolph Giuliani. Uh, who went on in the next election cycle uh, to become mayor of New York and introduced what all of us on the street called Giuliani time, which meant that the cops could do whatever uh, they wanted. Uh, Giuliani hired William Bratton as the uh, top cop in New York, and he uh, introduced the broken windows philosophy of policing, which basically said that the cops needed to establish law and order in all the minutia and details of life in those crime-prone communities, a code word for the black community, or else people, uh, volatile elements, meaning young black men, would just get out of control. And so the police became, as they said, another code word, proactive. And we saw the beginnings of stop and frisk on a gargantuan scale in New York City. Uh, but you can't understand uh, the, uh, the coming of stop and frisk on that kind of scale uh, without the context of the Central Park Five and the media lynch mob uh, that created the political uh, environment in which Giuliani uh, would win. Now, there are so many connections, political connections, that you uh, have repeatedly mentioned that connect this case to uh, the, the 2016 elections with, this, with the, the resurgence of Hillary Clinton's uh, lobbying uh, for the 94 crime bill uh, that her husband was a champion of, that Joe Biden actually helped co-author, that we are now relitigating again. And the connection there is this, this report by uh, a, 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 a college professor, John DeLulio Jr., called The Coming of the Super Predators. Mm -hmm. And this report was what 
precipitated uh, this term super predators being used in relation to these so-called gang of unrepentant, uncontrollable thugs. And super predators is a term that Delulio uh, coined. But the connection is clear between the roving gang of wilding youths or thugs as uh, 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 the prosecutor Fairstein called them uh, when she was uh, um, uh, uh, investigating the Central Park Five case, the, the connection is clear between the way black youth and Latino youth, mostly poor, were characterized in the Central Park case and how they were characterized by John DeLulio in his coming of the super predator study and how that continued throughout White House policy. And we see that thread even today as we are watching now video camera uh, footage of police officers, uh, not just handcuffing children, but also tasing children, children who are toddlers, children as young as five and six, black children, Latino children, and even shooting and killing them. Is it a surprise that given these connections between the Central Park Five case, the super predator uh, mythology that, can't, that rose through the Clinton administration, the connection with Rudy Giuliani and the broken windows policing stop and frisk, and now the hyper uh, militaristic, uh, hyper weaponized, very uh, racialized re-election campaign of Donald Trump, is it a surprise that we are facing the fascist police state that we have? No, we are part of the mass black incarceration state of uh, which the Central Park Five is just one chapter in this long saga. And it's a saga that begins at the end of our mass black movement of the 60s uh, and the defeat of uh, legal uh, apartheid. And the uh, U.S. rulers in society uh, were faced with a quandary with the defeat of U.S. apartheid by the civil rights movement. Black people were no longer confined by law as a class uh, and had no intention of being on the bottom and a second-class citizenship anymore. Uh, so the ruling class's problem was, how do we uh, contain them by other means? Uh, and the answer was, well, we'll do it uh, with the police uh, and the rest of the criminal justice system, uh, which had to then be uh, high, hugely expanded and heavily uh, militarized. But you have to have another story in order to create this mass black incarceration state. And that is the story, uh, to put it in, one, in a word, of black folks wilding uh, that this uh, new regime of militarized policing was necessary because it's all that will keep these volatile, volatile and otherwise uncontrollable uh, elements in check and uh, keep white society safe. The press, by the way, played uh, much the same role in the Central Park Five uh, case as they historically uh, have done uh, since back in the days of, of Jim Crow, uh, when newspapers would routinely write headlines like, Black Buck runs amok which was a prelude, almost a call, for the lynch mobs to come out. And some newspapers in the South would even run headlines uh, announcing when the lynching was scheduled for. Well, they don't operate that blatantly uh, today, but they do so quite effectively, and their reach is just as pervasive uh, as it was in the old days uh, of lynching. But lynching, of course, was a method of social control, and it was based on the presumed savagery, if uncontrolled, of the black population. So it's really no different uh, uh, in today's mass black incarceration state in terms of how it is justified uh, than the lynching state down south was. Well, there is so much more we could talk about uh, with this 
uh, docudrama, with the release of this docudrama, with this continuing examination of this extremely important case and moment in time in history. But we have to leave it here because we are simply out of time. But we will continue to examine how policing in black communities is not only a reflection of our history, but it's an accurate indicator of the, our future to come. So thank you, Glenn Ford, for joining me today. Thank you. And thank you for watching. This is Jacqueline Lukeman, and this is The Real News Network.